Good morning. Welcome to Woodland United Methodist Church. It's wonderful to be in God's house, to be ready to experience the holiness of God, the presence of God, to be overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. Let's prepare ourselves for worship now as we listen to our weekly updates. Good morning. This is what's happening for the church for the week of September 12th, 2021. Our women's Bible study begins tonight from 5 to 7 p.m. and we'll be meeting in room 301-303. For more information, reach out to Juliet. Our church council meeting is tonight at 7 p.m. We'll be meeting in room 301-303 down the hall. And if you're not able to make it, please be sure to submit your report to Betty Jean. Our youth group school kickoff is tonight at 5.30 p.m. at Ebenezer Park. We'll be meeting there and we'll be having dinner as well as talking about the activities and having a devotional. I hope to see you guys there. Our quilting ministry is meeting at 12.30 p.m. this Wednesday in room 301-303. Our handbell choir is back, and we're going to be rehearsing every Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m. And our regular choir is back, and they are rehearsing from 7 to 8 p.m., also on Wednesday evenings. So if you're interested in either the handbell choir or our normal vocal choir, reach out to Jonathan for more details. Next Sunday, we have a special youth group. We'll be meeting here at Wesley Hall, as we normally do, but we are inviting our youth group parents to also join us for that youth group. During that, we'll be talking about Pumpkin Patch, the expectations, and announcing our mission trips for the 2022 summer. Hope to see you guys there. Next Sunday, September 19th at 4 p.m., our United Methodist Women have a general meeting and would like to invite all women of the church to come out and participate. And that's just some of the things happening here at Woodland this week. Of course, we have scouts, stretch and walk, circles, and so much more happening. To find out how you can become involved here at Woodland, reach out to us in the church office, check out our newsletter or our website for more details. And now, let's prepare ourselves for worship as we join in this hymn. Please join me in singing hymn number 145, Morning Has Broken. The Old Testament reading for today comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now we come to our time of prayer. Let us begin with our congregational prayer. Let us pray. 
eternal light, shine into our hearts. Eternal goodness, deliver us from evil. Eternal power, be our support. Eternal wisdom, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Eternal pity, have mercy upon us, that with all our heart and mind and soul and strength, we may seek your face and be brought by your infinite mercy to your holy presence. O gracious Lord, come to us anew. O gracious Lord, embrace us anew. O gracious Lord, lift us up to new possibilities in thy grace and thy mercy and in thy love. Let us be prepared for whatever you have in store for us. Let us be ready to go forth in your name. Let us be equipped so that we can go forth and be a testimony of the grace, the love, the joy, the peace that you offer to each and every person. If we would just turn our hearts over to you and let you guide us in your way. And so, Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing for each and every one of us at this moment as you whisper to us your will for each of our lives and you prepare us to be an instrument of mercy to the world, that we may go forth and be an instrument of hope, that we may go forth and testify just through our lives and our living that, lo, you're with us always, even unto the end of the world. And so, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing for us right now. We also lift up those who need a special touch of your grace, your love, your mercy, your touch, a healing presence, a delivering power. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're reaching out to them even now. And you're whispering to all the angels you send to them, doctors, nurses, caregivers, therapists, friends, everyone you send at the right time to bring your word of hope and to bring your spirit of deliverance. We thank you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that as we celebrate all of these things, we thank you that we can celebrate who we are, that we are the people of God, the family of God, the children of God, disciples of Christ, followers of Christ, the very body of Christ in service and love. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you. And because we are who we are, we are one in you and one in this prayer as we testify to our oneness by sharing together in the very prayer that you, Lord Jesus, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we come to the time of our worship service where you can give back to God, but a portion of what he has given you. Let us give as God would so direct you to give. Give generously to the missions of this church, to the missions of our community, and to the United Methodist Church.
Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we come to you now bringing back but a portion of what you have so blessed us with. We ask that you take these gifts and you would bless them and bless the giver. God, we ask that you would take these gifts and use them to furthering your work here on this earth through Woodland, through our United Methodist Church, and in our community. We thank you for all that we have and all that you have given us. Bless us this day, O Lord. Amen. And now we come to the reading of our gospel, John chapter 8, verses 21 through 25. Again he said to them, I am going away, and you will search for me, but you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Then the Jews said, Is he going to kill himself? Is that what he means by saying, Where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he or I am. They said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, why do I speak to you at all? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now we're looking at this scripture and we're looking at what I titled as the God who stoops. The God who comes to us, who lowers himself so he can raise us up. The God who comes to us. That's hard for people to grasp sometimes, that God would stoop for us, that God would lower himself for us, just to be with us, just to lift us up. Can you imagine that? But then even when we talk about him stooping for us, we sometimes begin to take advantage of that by expecting things from him. Well, if he thinks that highly of us, he'll stoop for us. Then let's see what we can do to get from him, what we can get from him. What do we want him to do for us? Now, he comes into our world, but he's not of the world. He makes that clear. And we know as we read on in Scriptures that if those who follow him are his disciples, then they're not of this world either. They're changed. They become someone else. They become his and not theirs. And so when they approach Christ, they approach him with the knowledge that he is Lord, not them. It's the knowledge that they have to step out of this world and into his. They have to live his way in his life through his purpose and let it become our purpose in our life. In our way, because we want to be with Him more than anything. We want to walk with Him more than anything. But that's not what happens in the world. Religious people have a tendency to always take control. They have a tendency to want to not change. They just want to use these new resources that might come their way. And in this case, the new resource for many religious people is Jesus. They see Him as a resource. Someone they can go to in desperation. Someone they can go to when they want something from Him. That's the way prayers are often done in organized religion. As we organize religion, we organize it after the way of the world, the way we've lived in the world. We want to use the same principles we use in the world and apply Jesus to that. And so I can go to Him and tell Him what I want and what I need and what I, where I want to go and what I want to be and where I want to act and do and what I want to do. I can go to him with all these concerns and thoughts and expect him to step in and take care of it. Only because I've gotten to a place where I feel like I can't handle it by myself. And I'm disappointed when I can't handle it by myself. But in desperation, I will go to my extra resource, which might be Jesus or God. And that's what we do. But that's not faith. And when Jesus stooped down for us, He stooped down to lift us out of our sin. And our sin is self-righteous, selfish, self-serving humanity. Being someone who's always thinking about themselves and them and theirs and no, not about others and theirs. Me and mine versus them and theirs. And Jesus has come to pull us out of our sin, to save us from our sins to change us. If you don't want to be changed, you can't belong to Him. And Jesus even used the words, you will die in your sins if you don't let me do something about it and change you and lift you up. Do we go to Jesus because we want Him to do something for us? 
Or do we go to Jesus because we want to know whatever He wants us to do for Him, whatever we can do for Him? That now He is Lord. Now His will is more important than anything else in our lives. Are we coming to Him because we desire that something more that He offers? So Jesus is speaking to religious people. People who say they believe in God. People who say they serve God. People who say they want to walk with God. He's coming to them. And He's saying to them, you're going to die in your sins because you don't know who I am. You remember now, He also offered that word of grace. He says at the beginning, like it's just a, a foregone conclusion, you're going to die in your sins but then he says the second time, you are going to die in your sins unless, that's the word of grace, unless you recognize the fact of who I am, unless you give yourself to me, unless you surrender yourself to me, unless you believe that I am who I am, that I am the I am. The ever-present one, the ever-loving one, the ever-coming one, the ever-giving one, the one who never, ever leaves. Imagine what your life would be like if you believed in the I am. If you believe, really believe, don't just say you believe, don't just say I believe in Jesus, He's the Savior of the world, He died on the cross for my sins. You say all those words, it's just God talk. But when it comes to it, you do what you think is best, you do it your way, and very literal conversation with Jesus unless you're desperate. And then it's just to ask Him to help you do what you want to do. Jump in there, Lord. You can help me. I've already decided what I'm going to do. I've already decided for you what your kingdom is going to look like. I've already decided what your work is going to look like in the world. But I'm having a little problem convincing people. I'm having a little problem making people understand the way of the world. So would you please help me convince them to follow my advice and my direction? Help me to be able to accomplish all the things I want to accomplish. Oh, that's the way we pray. We go to God with our list. We tell Him what we expect, what we want, what we would desire. Very rarely do we ever say, Your will be done, because we don't want His will to be done. We want His will to be our will. We want our will to be done. Oh, we don't want a God in whose image we are to be recreated through Christ. We want a God created in our image who follows our way. And we want to convince ourselves that He's okay with it. Jesus surely understands. We talk about His love. We talk about His compassion. We talk about His unconditional love. And we think we can take advantage of that by simply telling Him what we want. What will make us happy? Aren't you here, Jesus? Isn't Jesus like Santa Claus we're saying that's going to bring us whatever we want for Christmas? He's going to bring us what we want in our lives. He's going to give us what will make us smile and things that we know would be great. And so we go to Him asking Him for these things. But how often do we say, we're ready, Lord. I'm ready to change. I know I can't follow You unless I'm always open to change. If I'm always ready to become something I'm not. If I'm not always ready to let You grow inside of me, Your Spirit in me, so that I can go forth and speak your words. That when I speak, it will truly be as the prophets of old, but now it's not just certain prophets, it's every follower of Christ. That when they speak, they speak Christ. They speak Christ in everything they say and everything they do, and they go. But Jesus says, be careful. If you don't listen to me, if you don't realize this world is not my world, unless you realize that you have to step out of this world, even right here, right now, step into my world, then you will notice, then you will see, then you will experience, then you'll be aware of me. You will hear my voice as I speak to you. You will see my face as I stand in front of you. You will feel me, you will know me, you will notice me. Every time I come, and you will look around and see me in and through and about everyone and everything. You'll see the potential. You'll see the possibilities. And you'll see me. 
trying to come out, trying to be drawn out of people. Because everyone has that of God within them. Everyone has that spirit there. We were created to serve, but we were created to become. We were created to be someone that we're not now. Sin has got in the way. We become self-serving, self-righteous. We become selfish. We've not become Christ in the world. So Jesus came to save those willing to change. Listen to that carefully. He didn't come here just to help you get through this world. He didn't come here just to help you fulfill your dreams and your wants and your desires. He came here to offer you the possibility of change. Because without changing, there's no salvation. Without changing, there's no becoming. Without changing, this world continues to be the world that you served and walk in and live in. Isn't that something? We go to church and we, we get there and we have people telling us all the time, this is the way to do things. When we look at the world and how the world does things, so many people have decided in the religious people, like the people Jesus was talking to right there, they've already decided that following, Christ, following God is simply by going out into the world and serving God. They believe they're becoming something simply by staying like they are and not changing at all. They believe that they're in control and they know best. And they want Jesus to serve this world with them instead of them serving him in his world. That's what they want. That's why they're, they're all frustrated and they get angry when anyone suggests anything different. That's why they get mad when we talk about welcoming people who are being rejected, excluded, kicked out, pushed aside, saying they don't belong here. They get mad about that because it doesn't fit into their plans. It doesn't fit into their self-serving purposes. It doesn't fit into them taking control of everything. But they still want God. They still want to believe in God. They still want to say that He's with them and leading them. And so Jesus was a thorn in every religious person's side. It was the religious people who had a problem. It wasn't the, those who weren't religious who had a problem. They're the ones who were coming to Christ in droves. It was the religious people who had already made their decisions, already worked out what was right and what was wrong. They had a Bible verse after all. They could just go to that Bible verse and justify pretty much anything they were doing. And here's Jesus throwing a, a monkey wrench and all of that and saying, you will die in your sins unless, unless you come to me. Unless you let go unless you become, you will die in your sins. Unless you walk in this, my world. Unless you're willing, always willing, not to become rigid and complacent and content. Always willing to be transformed and remade. Imagine our lives in Christ. If you don't want Christ, don't go to Christ. If you don't want to give everything up, don't give everything up. Just stay like you are. But please don't be a hypocrite. But also don't abuse Christ by saying, you're my Lord. You're my Savior. You're my friend. And then when He speaks, you ignore Him. Or you try to turn away from Him. Or you try to find a Bible verse that says you don't have to listen to Him. He's wrong in this. He's wrong in this. It's interesting because when you look, think about the Bible verses that people threw at Jesus, you were doing things on the Sabbath, and the Bible says that's sin, so obviously you're a sinner. You were allowing your disciples to eat grain on the Sabbath, or the Bible says you shouldn't do that, and you had them doing that, so obviously you're a sinner. He touched a leper. He touched people who were unclean. The Bible said, if you do that, you're sinning. So obviously Jesus is a sinner. 
Everything he did was not the way we do things. And anytime he did anything, it wasn't the way we've always done things. We've always been taught to do things. He was being a sinner. But Christ was not a sinner. It was the ones who were pointing fingers. It was the ones who were passing judgment. It was the ones who were saying, you don't belong. You're not of God. You're not proper according to Scripture. They're the ones who were the sinners. It was sad that they didn't realize it. They didn't see it. And they didn't see it now. The Savior of the world, the Creator in Christ, their actual God present in Jesus was standing in front of them. And they couldn't see it. They couldn't hear it. They couldn't notice. How sad you think Jesus was at that moment. He loved them. He didn't say you will die in your sins because he wanted to, them to die in their sins because they had upset him. He's not like us. But we can become like him. He's not us, but we can become him. And we don't ask him, Jesus, come on and walk with us so we can do all the things that we feel are important in this world. But rather we say, Lord Jesus, let us walk with you so that we can do the things that you know are important, that you know will change other hearts. Help us help others discover what we've discovered in you. And yes, it will make people angry. Yes, it will make people persecute. Yes, it will make people attack because we're overturning the apple cart. I should say, we're pushing it aside so people can see there's something more. So they can become what they can never become without. And we say that language all the time. Jesus died on the cross to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Well, it's time we let him do it. If we believe. That's why he used the word, you will die in your sins because you don't believe that I am. I am the God who stays. I am the God standing next to you. I am the God who will never leave you or forsake you. I am the one who will make it possible for you to do the impossible. So stop trying to handle things yourself like you can handle it. Or it's what you want. But let me change you and enable you and empower you. And when you say, I can't, you don't have to. Because I'm here, we would do it together. And we can, if you let me. So it's time for us to decide. You know, when people say to me, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I don't know if I'm serving God. I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, I'm hoping. Let's tell them there is a way to know when you let go. When you turn everything over to Him. When you... Let him change you. You want to change. When you decide you want to change, a miracle will happen. Confidence will come. Peace will come. Assurance will come. And you will boldly get up and do what you can never do. And you will boldly turn it all over to Jesus, no matter how scary the situation looks. And you will do what he says do without question. That's why I say, I've said so often at finance meetings and church meetings, the only question is, what does Jesus want us to do? And then once we come to realize what we believe Jesus is saying, not what we may think, but what he wants us to do, and then we'd say, well, okay, Lord, that's what we're going to do. We know you'll provide the resources, you'll provide the means, and you'll help us discover what we need to do to fulfill what you want us to do. But what if it's not what he wants us to do? We don't say, well, we got the money, we got the resources, we got plenty of money, we got plenty of possibilities. We can do this because we've got everything we needed. We've prepared ourselves fully to have everything in place so we can do what we want to do. But if it's not what he wants to do, then we should say no. What are you talking about? No, we've got the resources, we can do it. This would be a wonderful ministry. This would be a wonderful opportunity for us to draw people into the church maybe by through this process. But this is what he wants us to do. Why do we not ask? Why do we pray before a meeting, Lord, please take control, and then during the meeting not mention him once? 
Why would we do that? Unless we want to know, if we don't want to know what he wants us to do, but what if we did want to know? And it, while we're thinking and talking and sharing, that he, at least in our mind, in our hearts, we're thinking about it. But what does Jesus really want? And what will bring glory to him? Well, let's remember that today. As we go forth in his spirit and in his name, let us go forth believing. Let us go forth trusting. And let us, if we want to be saved, we really want Christ to live inside of us. If we really want to lead this world and enter his world right here, right now, not someday, but right now, so that we can look out into the world and see through his eyes and his heart and his mind and his spirit. And we can know the joy of his presence enveloping us. We will notice and there'll be peace and joy. We'll notice him. Or would you rather just leave it like it is as someone we just call out to that we can't see, we can't hear, we can't feel, but we got a Bible verse that says he's there and we want to believe that Bible verse when we say the words we say. But there's just no power because we don't know it. We don't have it. We haven't experienced it. Let's go forth in that power, in that presence, and say, Jesus, I give myself to you and I will go where you say go and do what you say do no matter what. And I will, I just want you to live inside of me every moment of every day. Go forth in his name. Amen.